So new series starts today. Let me start by reading out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus' words gives a little bit of a parable. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey it is foolish. And it's like a person who builds their house on, do you know the story? On sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Now, Jesus tells that story, that parable, at the end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount you'll find in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So he wraps that up. That's his closing statement. He said, out of everything that you've heard me say, out of everything that you've heard me teach, if you don't put it into practice, you're like a foolish person that builds their house on sand. And we all know that's not going to go well. But if you are wise and listen to these words of mine, all the things that he had taught in chapters 5, 6, and 7, then you're like a wise man who builds his house on the rock and it will be sturdy. The rains come, the difficulties come, the problems are thrown at you, yet the house stands. I say that and we kind of start at the end because this entire series of It's Complicated, we're going to be walking through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. But I need you to hear the end because it tells us how important the next four weeks are. That if we are willing to not just listen to Jesus' words, but also put them into practice, he's telling us that makes us wise because our house will be built on rock rather than sand. In fact, if you've got your Bible, you just flip through, you can start to see. Now, not that these headings were like from Jesus. That's us putting them in here later. But you see the different headings within the Sermon on the Mount. You see that we're going to talk about anger. You see revenge is on here. Enemies on, are, are on here. Prayer, money, possessions, worry, anxiety. You see all the different subjects that Jesus hits on. It's like you've got to understand how to walk through life with each of these. Because as we know, it's very complicated, isn't it? That's why Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount. That's why he, he said it originally and why we still have it today is to bring clarity to some confusion, to how we interact with people. Ultimately, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus saying, here's what life looks like in my kingdom. Here's how we act. Here's how we think. Here's how we behave. Here's how we love God. Here's how we love others. Here's how we treat others. Here's how we trust God. He said, here's how we do that in my kingdom, Jesus says. And I'm telling you, it's a little different than what the rest of our world sees. And it gets very complicated because we live in the world, but we're also called to live according to his word and his kingdom as well. So over the next four weeks, that's what we're going to look at. Jesus's words throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And I encourage you to be here for all four weeks because every single week is going to be valuable and important. And just like Jesus said at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you'll listen and put them into practice, it's like a wise man that builds his house on the rock. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your words. They are, they are active. They are alive. They, they pierce our hearts. They lead us. They guide us. They convict us. They change us. So may we focus on your words. Speak to us, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. So do you use duct tape in your house for just about everything? Yes, yes, guys. All right. So duct tape is useful for so many different things. In fact, if you were to Google, what can I use duct tape for? You are going to get thousands of responses. So let me just highlight a few because they're absolutely fascinating. We can use duct tape to make fly traps. I'd love to see what that would actually look like, but it's sticky enough to actually make fly traps. You can use it to remove warts. I don't know how I feel about that one, but apparently it helps remove warts. Uh, you can use it to fix all kinds of plumbing issues. If you're having issues with your plumbing, you can use duct tape for that. Let's see, here's the other list. A lint roller. You can use duct tape as a lint roller. You can use it to fix a tent, remove a splinter. You can use it to patch window screens. Oh, check this one out. This one just feels random. You can use it to make a on-the-go dog bowl for water, apparently. I'm not making this up. So out of all those, we go on and on and on about all the different uses for duct tape. But let me give you my three favorite. You can use duct tape to make a boat, an actual kayak, in fact, or a canoe. We've actually seen this done before. They made a duct tape canoe. 
pretty impressive. I love that they didn't trust themselves to get in it, so they just put the dog in it. <laughs> Something to be said there about trusting it. Then the guy took a trailer, which the trailer obviously was not made out of duct tape, but he was able to totally rig the trailer to be a camper out of duct tape. <laughs> totally waterproof and sealed it to make it out of duct tape. Now this last one, absolutely the favorite. And there's a little bit of a story behind it. So Beth, go ahead and show this next picture. This is an airplane in Alaska. And what had happened is the pilot had left some food in the plane. And if you live, uh, you know where this is going. If you live in Alaska and you put food where bears can get to it, bears will get to it. So these bears tore apart this plane to get to the food. I mean, it was just totally ripped apart. But then there's duct tape. So what the pilots did was right here, check this out. They wrapped the entire plane in duct tape and it still flew. <laughs> if you don't believe me, a pilot is the one that told me that story. So you're not just making this stuff up. Duct tape can be used for all kinds of things. But what's interesting is duct tape actually has one intended purpose, doesn't it? Thus the name. It was made, its intentional use was to be used to seal air ducts, which is why it's called duct tape, not duct tape for some of you, it's duct tape, <laughs> so that it could be used for air ducts. So out of all the uses of duct tape, <laughs> there's one specific intentional purpose. See, our lives, we wear many, many different hats. Right? Just think through your typical week on the different identities that you carry. Husband or wife, so spouse, parent or child, sometimes both, sibling, friend, neighbor, boss, employee, student, teacher. I mean, we just go through the list of all the different hats we each wear, and each of those different identities speak to something different we do, a way that we are to be used, a way that we are to act, and a way that we are to behave. The way we treat our spouse should be different than the way we treat employees and coworkers. The way we treat our neighbors versus how we treat a boss. So we're treating people differently according to who we are in that moment. And I'm telling you, it gets so confusing. It gets very complicated. And we usually wrestle with the question multiple times through our lives, what am I really doing? Like, yes, I'm doing all these different things and I'm useful in all these different ways. And I, I have these different roles and positions and jobs and identities. But at the end of the day, like, what is my real purpose? Who am I really? because it gets very complicated and it gets very confusing. And so Jesus helps us understand it with clarity. And that's what we're gonna pick up on in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter five, if you have your Bibles, starting in verse 13. Out of all the things that Jesus is gonna help us understand on what we do, he's gonna begin with who we are. And we're gonna talk about that because it's important. Matthew chapter five, verse 13. Here's Jesus's words to us. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. No, if you know the song. <laughs> instead, instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Here's the point, verse 16. He says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. Why? So that everyone will praise your heavenly father. There's our purpose. And why I love how Jesus starts this, because again, he's gonna get really specific and we're gonna follow him through the Sermon on the Mount in the next three weeks. And it's gonna be very specific on how we act in very specific environments, situations, and relationships. But starting out, he doesn't talk about exactly what to do. No, he points out, this is who you are. Instead of starting with what to do, he points out who you are. He says, you are salt. You are light, not just salt, light. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And the reason he does that is because our actions come from our identity. They should at least, right? Who you are determines what you do. 
So if you are salt and you are light, then you will act as salt and light. So he wants to get the identity down first. He wants to make sure our purpose is solidified, that who you are determines what you do. So why Jesus doesn't start with just all the things of behaviors first. He says, no, I want you to know your identity. I want you to know your purpose. You are salt. You are light. So that's what we're going to do. Let's talk through salt. Let's talk through light. Because if we're saying that's our identity, if that's our true purpose, yes, we're spouse and we're friend and we're neighbors and we're all these things. But at the end of the day, what compass, overcompasses all of them is that we are salt and light. We need to understand what that actually means for us. So let's talk about salt for a second. In fact, there was, they don't exist anymore, there was a salt institute that had come up with all of these different uses for salt. In fact, they had a list of over 14,000 uses for salt, benefits of salt. Many of them you probably know, it's a preservative, it can purify, it melts ice, it adds flavor to taste. Like, so there's all these different uses, plus like 13,995 more than what I just listed. There's all these different uses, but bottom line at the end of the day, salt is useful. It is extremely useful. And because it's useful, it's also valuable. When you add salt to an environment, when you add salt to a food, when you add salt to something, guess what it does? It changes it. It changes it. It makes a difference. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's looking at us as believers, as followers of him saying, your life matters because your life also makes a difference. Salt changes things. You, through the Holy Spirit, can change things. Your life makes a difference. Let me give you just some quick general examples here. Right, when a friend or somebody comes to you and they're hurting as the salt of the earth, guess what we do? We bring comfort. When there's difficulties in somebody else's life, we bring compassion. When there's tragedy and crisis, we bring hope. When there's troubles and struggles, we bring joy, is what we're told in James chapter one. We are the salt of the earth. We change the environment that we're in. We do good things and we add value to people so that there can be a difference made. Paul in Galatians speaks to this as well. He says this, Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. Therefore, when we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith, a family of believers. We are to do good, to not become weary in doing good, to continue to do good. And even as Jesus says here, if we fail to do so, what good is it? Right? He talks about salt. If it loses its saltiness, it's not good for anything except being trampled on. So as believers, we are intended to do good for others, to bring value to other people's lives based on the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me give you some questions. Hopefully these are helpful. Take a picture of these or write these down. Are, are you being salt in your different relationships and in your different environments? Here's three questions. Let's talk through them. Am I being useful? That we just said, there's a ton of uses for salt. So we weren't intended to just sit off to the side, right? Salt is only helpful and useful if it's used. You don't do, salt doesn't do any good just on its own. It has to be added. It has to be used and put, put into good use. So am I being useful? Let me just say this. For those of you over the last month, we did this in July, ended last week, where we were asking for back to school supplies that we donated to our, our Dawson County schools. Man, thank you for donating all the papers and pens and binders and notebooks and backpacks. That's us as a church being helpful and being useful and doing good and being salt. You're helping other people. So if you were part of that, yes, most definitely. You're being useful, helpful. You're being salt. What impact am I having on other people? We said that salt, when you, when you insert it into an environment, when you place it on something, there's a change that happens. So think of your family. What impact do you have on your family? Is your, this is a hard question, but let me just ask it. Is your spouse better today than yesterday because of you? Yes or no? I see a lot of wives like just stare straight ahead and not going to answer this one right now. The husbands are like, move on, Brian, move on. All right, let's go to the next one. 
Do I leave people better and closer? I'd say even more importantly, closer to Jesus. Do I leave people? And when I interact with somebody, even if they're not close, we talked about spouses before, what about just like the random person you encounter? You know, the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant, the person in the checkout line at Kroger or Walmart, after an encounter with you, have you left them better and closer to Jesus or no? Because salt would say yes. Everything that I touch, everything that I'm part of, every relationship I have, every person I interact with changes because of what God is doing through me. So that would be salt. Let's talk about light for a second. What about light? See, light doesn't run from the darkness. No, we're, it's very obvious that light shines through the darkness. Or if you've ever been flying at night and you look out and it's all dark, but then you see all the pockets of cities, right? You see them, that's obvious because those cities are lit up. The lights are on. So it's very easy to tell the difference between the populated areas and the unpopulated areas because of light. It's very obvious. Light is obvious. When you're in a dark room and you turn on the light, everybody knows. Everybody can tell because it's obvious. It's different. So in salt, we say that, that we make a difference. Your life makes a difference. As light, we say that your life should look different. It should look different. It's the difference truly between night and day, dark and light. The lives that we live according to God's word should look different. If you're a hold up, and that's again what Jesus is doing as he goes through. Here's what life is like in my kingdom, in my world, not the world, but Jesus like in my kingdom. Here's what your lives are to look like. And yes, they are to look different different because we think differently. We talk differently. We act differently. We spend our money differently. We treat people differently. Everything that we do is different because of God's teaching through his son Jesus here. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples this. Let me show you an example. Later on in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is getting his disciples together and he point, it was a great teachable moment. You can read more in context later on, but basically what they were talking about was they want the, they want the authority They want to be seen and they want to be noticed. The disciples wanted that. And so Jesus said, nah, you're missing the whole point of being my follower. So look at what he said, verse 25 out of Matthew chapter 20. But Jesus called them together, talking about his disciples. And he said this, his words, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. In other words, the world looks at authority as a position to be held. Right? If I have the authority, I'm going to exercise my authority. You have to do what I say because I have that position of authority. That's what the world does. And then Jesus looks at his disciples and he says this, verse 26, but among you, it will be different. Say the word different, different. But among you, disciples, it is going to be totally different. We're not going to act that way. We're not going to be that way. We are going to be light and light is obviously different, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. That's different. Verse 27, whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That's very different. But he says, but that's who I am. Verse 28, for even the son of man talking about himself came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you see what he's trying to teach the disciples, what he's trying to teach us? Man, if you're using how people act as the world, as our standard, you're, you're missing it. No, we are called to be light. We're called to be different. Everything about our lives is different as followers of Jesus. He says, but among you, it will be different. Not so with you. You are called to live differently. So let's ask those questions. What are the questions of light? What does it look like to be light? Here they are. Here's the first one. What do people see when they see me? Man, that's such a good question. Going back to what Jesus was teaching his disciples. When you see the rulers and the authorities of the world, what do you see? You see tyrants. You see ego. You see pride. You see all kinds of things. He says, but what do you see when you see me? A servant. So what do people see when they see you? Second question, what does my life lead others to do? Another way to say it is, how does my, what does my life encourage or inspire other people to do? Because we're all helping move people someplace. The question is where? And if you go back to what Jesus said, talking about light, he tells us what it should be. 
In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, not so that we get credit for it. No, he says the exact opposite. So everyone will praise your heavenly father. So as our lives look different, what does that lead other people to do? To praise God, to, to move closer to God even. What does my life lead other people to do? Last question, how does my life look different? If we are truly light, then it's going to be obvious. In a dark world, the light is obvious. Is your life different? How is it different? Now let's hang out there just for a second, all right? So follow me down this, this road just for a second. I wanna teach you something. This is just something that kind of I live by. So here, let me help you understand what I call the 12-2 pause. Here's what the 12-2 pause says. It says, if my life looks like everyone else's, that should give me pause. Now, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that if my life looks like everybody else's, something is wrong. Not necessarily. But it should at least cause me to pause long enough on, should it then look different? If my life, you know, I could go through different relationships, different environments, different situations, go through the whole thing. If my life looks like everybody else's, that should give me at least a moment to pause and ask the second question. Well, should it be looking different? The reason I call it the 12-2 pause is because it comes out of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let's look at it. Romans 12-2 says this. Paul says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Thus the pause, right? If our life just looks like everybody else's, well, then I would want to pause long enough to say, am I just copying the behaviors and the customs of the world that I'm supposed to be different from? Do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you. That means change us. Transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what am I supposed to do? Well, we're first of all supposed to be different. That's the whole idea. Salt and light is who we are. And out of who we are comes what we do. Say this with me. Say, I am salt. I am light. Say it again. I am salt and I am light. And when you say I am salt, you're saying my life matters and it makes a difference because when you put salt into any environment, it changes the environment. When you place it on any food, it changes everything about that food. Light, when we say that we are light, when we are the light of the world, it means that we are different. That people, when they see us in our actions and our good deeds and how we live and how we think and how we talk and everything about our lives, our marriages and our parenting and our schedules and our finances, go through the whole list. When people see that, they say, wow, that's different. And I actually kind of wish I had it. Notice that it's they see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven, not they see your good deeds and wish they had nothing to do with you. Sometimes we miss that last part. Let's be honest. Well, I'm different. I'm going to make sure everybody knows it. I'm going to make sure they know that I'm different. And it doesn't lead people closer to Jesus. No, as salt and light, we make a difference. Our life is different. But here's the whole point. Your purpose is to point people to Jesus. That's it. That's it. Your purpose, what Jesus is getting at as salt and light, and that's how he ends it, so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Your purpose is to point other people to Jesus. Again, we have a lot of different uses. We have a lot of different roles in our life, don't we? We've already talked about a bunch of them. Again, as spouse and parents and employees. There's a lot of different uses and roles that we all have in our lives, a lot of the different hats that we wear. But at the end of the day, we have one main intentional purpose, to point people to Jesus. So here's what I want you to like, let's dig in just a little bit more because that most of you are probably like, yeah, I think I know that. I kind of knew that. Let's really dig in though. Would you just for a second, like think through your week? If that's too much, think through a day, <laughs> if your days are crazy. Right? If I were to go through 
all the different environments, relationships, and places, the question should be coming up, well, how am I pointing, to G- pointing people to Jesus there? And how am I pointing people to Jesus there? So when I wake up in the morning, the first thing we do is we get our kids up to go to school. Like that's a, still a relatively new thing, just a few days old, obviously. So instead of just my purpose is to make sure that they get fed and get their book bags and get on the bus, can my purpose be how do I point them to Jesus first thing in the morning? Oh, that'll change your family's day. So then I get my kids on the bus and we walk down to the bus with them. And then I'm looking at all my neighbors that are at the bus stop. I'm like, how can I point these people to Jesus today? Just by being salt and light. I get the kids on the bus and I get in my car and I drive to whatever meeting I have. How I'm driving, how does that point people to Jesus? Not send them to Jesus, but point them to Jesus. <laughs> when I have a meeting, sometimes those meetings are with our staff members, sometimes those are with our volunteers, sometimes it's with many of you that just have questions about life and are looking for spiritual guidance. How do I point people to Jesus in those meetings? A lot of my meetings are around coffee and lunches. So on, when I'm in coffee shops and I'm in restaurants, how am I pointing the people around me to Jesus? We talked about Bible studies earlier today, how I want you to be part of a Bible study, either on your own, in your home, or in a group. So I lead a Bible study of men um, at Panera Bread Wednesdays at 7.30 in the morning. And we'll be kicking, we're taking a break right now. We'll kick back off in September with everybody else. You know why we do Panera Bread? because I want other people to see what about 20 guys do every Wednesday morning with opening their Bibles. And guess what? The baristas notice that and see that. They ask, what are you guys doing again? I had a total stranger, no joke, last week come up to me and he's seen us back there a bunch. And I promise if you're at Panera at 7.30 in the morning, like you're part of our Bible study, we're just loud enough. And he came up to me afterwards. He's like, now like what happens back there? (laughs) I'd never met him before. And I said, well, it's a group of guys. We just study the Bible every, uh, every Wednesday morning. He said, oh, wow. And I got to introduce myself to him, and his name's Daniel. How can I point people to Jesus that I may never really know much about them, but they see the difference of salt and light? Now, we're still early in the morning of my day. What about your day? What happens when you come home? How are you pointing your family to be closer to Jesus? Everything that you do on the phone, everything that you do online, let's say that one more time, everything that you do online, every encounter you have, salt and light to make a difference. Oh, to make a difference in people's lives because of Jesus by pointing them to Jesus. That's our purpose. Everything that you do during the week falls underneath salt and light. Salt and light as a husband, salt and light as a wife, salt and light as a daughter, salt and light as a son, salt and light as a boss, salt and light as an employee, salt and light as a teacher, salt and light as a student, salt and light as whoever you are in those moments. You are salt and you are light. And we point people to Jesus every day. I love how Paul describes this and how he was trying to be salt and light. Paul, one of the apostles, planted many, many, many churches early on in the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 31. Listen to the salt and light language. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. All that you do, do it to point to God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything that I do. Now, let me explain that for a second. He says, I, too, try to please everyone in everything that I do. He's not talking about pleasing people's happiness. Has nothing to do with just pleasing people because, look at the next part of what he says. He says, I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. So we're salt so that many might be saved. We're light so that many might be saved. And how we think and how we talk and how we act and how we do life. Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, we're different and people recognize it and they want what we have. So if you are a believer, if you're a Christian, if you claim to follow Jesus, oh, you are salt and light. 
and your life makes a difference and your life is different. And we, we use that to point people to Jesus every single day. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you're still trying to figure those things out, I mean, can I encourage you to just start with saying, Jesus, I need you in my life, right? Just like he said, the son of man came to serve, not to be served, to give his life as a ransom for many. Just like Paul said, I'm doing everything that I'm doing so that people would be saved. I mean, that's why we do what we do. If you're sitting in this room, if you're watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, everything that we do as a church is so that you would know Jesus. Everything that we do is so that you would know Jesus. Romans 10 tells us that if we believe in our heart, we say it with our mouth that he is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That's where you start. It's not getting your life all together. It's not doing all the right things and the good things. It's saying, Jesus, I'm a mess and a wreck and I need you in my life because out of all the things that Jesus was and continues to be, all the good that he did, do you know what his number one priority is? Saving you. All the healings and all the miracles and all the teachings comes down to him restoring your life back to the Father. So if you haven't made that decision yet, that's where you start. If you have, every day is a new day of purpose of pointing people to Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come before you and we thank you so much for all that you are to us, but most importantly, we thank you that you are Savior. You are our Lord, our King, and our Savior, and we are desperate for a Savior. We recognize the world that we live in is desperate for a Savior, so may we be salt and light. May we live differently. May we treat others differently. That causes people to be pointed back to you. May everything that we think, say, do, type, send, write, everything that we do, may it point other people back to you in some way. Jesus, help our eyes to see our, the world differently. May we see our purpose differently as salt and light. Holy Spirit, I would pray that anyone who hasn't accepted you into their heart yet would do so now and say that I'm not perfect, I'm a mess. That's why we need a savior and that's why you came. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, for the sacrifice that took our sins away, for your resurrection that gives us life now and for all of eternity. We come to you because you're the only one to come to. We point others to you because there's no one else to point to. In Jesus' name, amen.